This lecture will cover replication as it relates to the DNA strand, so let's get started. Um, as you see here on the screen, replication is essentially what we're using when we're trying to duplicate or make another copy of our DNA strand. So we're going to use that original DNA template as kind of like a guide or a blueprint as we make more copies. So you've copied something before. You'll have an original copy, which will be your DNA strand, and then you're going to use that strand to duplicate it or make a brand new strand based off of that original. So let's talk about a few points before we get too deep into the process. With DNA replication, we have a starting point, and that starting point is actually called the origin of replication. So this is the particular place or opening where replication begins. So you have seen a strand of DNA at this point. Of course, it's double-stranded. And if you look here, let's say replication will begin at this point, that will be called your origin of replication. As we start to unwind or pull apart those two strands, we are going to create a space called a replication bubble. So you see here, as we're opening the strands, we're unwinding the strands, we're creating this replication bubble. On either side of the replication bubble, you're going to see these forks. So just like a fork in the road where the road will split, you'll see each end of the bubble has a replication fork. Um, and DNA replication is going to proceed outward, so they'll proceed towards the fork. So you see right here, this is the replication bubble. You're going to have replication moving to the left towards one fork or to the right towards the other fork. So it's going to be, imagine pulling those strands apart. If you had a finger here and a finger here pulling them apart, the bubble will start getting wider on either side and that's where the replication will occur. So go to the left over here and then it'll go to the right over here. So for bacteria, they usually have a single origin of replication. That's because their bacteria, uh, excuse me, their DNA is usually circular. So it has the ability to be able to, you know, just literally start in one place and go around the circle. But our DNA is very, very long. It can be up to three feet of DNA per cell. So we typically have multiple origins of replication. It's not just in one particular area. So DNA replication is actually a little complex. So I wanna talk about it. Um, and before we get too deep into it, we gotta talk about some of the proteins that help to make it possible. So I have a little picture to the right and we're going to, I'm going to give you some definitions and explain it, and we'll continue to refer back to this image. So the first protein or enzyme, because you see the uh, ASC at the end, is called DNA helicase. So DNA helicase is going to bind to one strand, and it's going to travel from five prime to three prime to actually break those bases apart. So a few reminders, DNA does replicate only in the five prime to three prime direction. So that's very important. We've already talked about it, but it only replicates from five prime to three prime. Um, and the DNA helicase is like a zipper. So you understand what a zipper looks like, right? You have, um, let's say you have a, a hoodie or a jacket that has a zipped up portion. Think of the DNA helicase is being the zipper that is actually going to unzip those two sides. Um, so you have to ask yourself, what is it breaking? It's breaking the base pairs apart. So remember, the A will interact with the T or the G will interact with the C, but they're held together by which bond? A hydrogen bond. I hope you said that. <laughs> so a hydrogen bond is going to be what holds them together, right? Remember, a hydrogen bonds are the weakest bonds, but our DNA helicase will help to separate those two strands because we need to open the strands up so that we can actually copy their code and then make new strands. But for DNA helicase to work, we need another enzyme called DNA topoisomerase. So DNA topoisomerase moves a little bit ahead of the zipper or the helicase to stop the DNA from coiling amongst itself. 
Um, so the best example I have is um, if anybody knows how to braid hair, if you're braiding a long braid, you actually have to use your fingers to, to run through the hair at the bottom of the braid so that it doesn't tangle. Um, if you don't know how to braid hair, <laughs> then I'm just reminding you that as we start to unzip this portion of the DNA, the bottom portion of the DNA starts to kind of wind on itself and it will become a big knot if we don't have something to kind of smooth it out. So that's what the DNA topoisomerase is doing. It actually moves a little bit in front of the DNA helicase to try to stop the DNA from coiling or creating some type of knot. And that coil that it would create is actually called your super coil. So DNA topoisomerase is usually going to be first, and then you're going to have your DNA helicase after it, um, which is doing the actual un zipping or unbinding between that DNA molecule. And then you have another set of proteins called single stranded, excuse me, single strand binding protein. So SSBP, and this has a big job in making sure that the strands that you separated don't stick together again. So imagine a zipper going down the DNA. Once it zips the DNA, if this area doesn't have any buffer between it or any type of bumper there, it is going to re-adhere. It's going to stick together again. So by putting these little single-stranded binding proteins on the strand, it's going to make sure that the strands stay separated and they don't rebond um, after the helicase and the topoisomerase move down the DNA strand. So again, this is just a really big picture of everything. Again, our direction of replication is going to the left. Remember, every time you see a fork, your replication will go in that direction. Um, you have the topoisomerase. That's going to be the first protein to help keep it straight. You have DNA helicase, which actually does unzip the, the strands. And then you have single-stranded binding proteins, which will stick on the strand and help to keep it apart. So there's some more proteins that we need. Um, after we have the DNA strand opened, we need to start adding some proteins that are going to make the new strand. So remember, DNA is semi-conservative. We have the original or parent strand here in red, and we will be making a brand new daughter strand under that. If you're unfamiliar with that, make sure you look at the previous lecture videos. So as we put together those nucleotides, as we start to build our strand, A, T, G, C, we're going to need an enzyme that will form a covalent bond to link together those nucleotides. That enzyme is DNA polymerase. So as we build our new daughter strand and do A, T, G, C, C, all of those things together, that is going to require a DNA polymerase. The nucleotides are added to the three prime end because remember DNA goes from five prime to three prime. So we have to add it on the three prime end because it's starting at five and it's going down to three. So we're adding those nucleotides to the three prime end always. There is another enzyme called DNA primase. And if anybody has, um, either painted before. So if you paint, you might've heard of something called a primer, or if you use makeup, you may have heard of something called a primer. Both of these have a role in putting either a coat of, coat of paint down, like white paint if you're painting a wall, or you'll put the primer down before you add your foundation for makeup. All of these have a role in putting something down first before you add what you want, whether it's paint or foundation. So DNA primase does the same thing. It adds a short set of RNA nucleotides or a primer on the strand so that DNA polymerase can start. So DNA polymerase will start to add the strands A, B, C, I'm sorry, A, T, G, C, all of those nucleotides. But before it does, it needs to have some type of primer on that strand. That's because DNA polymerase cannot start on a bare strand. It needs to have something down before it starts covalently linking those nucleotides together. So again, I'm just showing you a picture here. 
let's say the red is the parent strand. Um, in this case, the red is the parent strand. You need to put a primer, that's yellow. You need to put a primer down so that DNA polymerase can start adding some blue nucleotides, right? So you put your primer down using DNA primase, and then from there, you can start adding nucleotides to that three prime end. So again, DNA primase puts the primer down that's made up of RNA nucleotides, and then DNA polymerase can start adding those nucleotides in the five prime to three prime direction. You see the arrow is going from five prime to three prime? That's what's happening here. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how we actually make that strand. So I told you about all the proteins you need to be able to break apart the strand and get the strand started, but we're, we're going to have a little bit of a challenge because of two rules. One of those rules is that this DNA polymerase cannot begin its synthesis on a bare strand. So we need to add a primer every time we start synthesizing new nucleotides from DNA polymerase. And the other issue is that DNA polymerase only works in a five prime to three prime direction. So it will only make new, or it will only add new nucleotides as it moves from five prime to three prime. So this is going to give us two types of strands that we have to make every time we replicate our DNA. One is going to be called the leading strand. This one is going to be very simple. The other one is called the lagging strand. Lagging means it's a little slow, it's behind. So we're gonna talk about how to make those two strands. Okay, so let's talk about that leading versus lagging strand. Again, I want to remind you that our DNA can only duplicate in the five prime to three prime direction. Um, I'm going to try to <laughs> draw just a little bit. It's gonna be very challenging with uh, my lack of software right now, but I'm going to try to draw just a few bits of information that I think may help you um, understand this. One is the direction of replication. I'm drawing this with a mouse. <laughs> and the other is reminding you about the direction of the daughter strand. So that's a five that I drew here, and then that's a three that I drew here. So let me switch back to my pointer and hopefully this will make some sense. Okay, so for our leading strand, let's first just look at our DNA molecule. That's right here. Our parent strand is in pink. So if the top side of the parent strand is five prime, that means this side of the parent strand is three prime. And because DNA runs anti-parallel, like how 95 North runs right next to 95 South is flipped, then the bottom strand is five prime here. And then on this end, it's three prime here. So that's the parent strand the pink strand, you see the five and the three are opposite from one another. Same thing with this five and with this three. So our new daughter strand has to match those same rules. So our new daughter strand for the bottom parent strand, it has to be five down here. And then this will be three here. That's for the bottom parent strand. For the top parent strand, if this one is a five prime, Anti-parallel says my new daughter strand will be three prime here. And then if it's three prime here, my new daughter strand will have a five prime, you know, here or on at least this side of the strand, it will be five prime. So keep those things in mind. Make sure you're always very aware of how that anti-parallel directionality works. So like I mentioned, this is our replication fork. So every time we replicate, we need to be replicating towards the replication fork. So the DNA replication is actually going to the right. That's why I tried to draw this a little bit. If you're looking at this, you wanna identify the leading strand. 
The leading strand is going to be the strand that has these following rules. It is a strand that is synthesized in one long molecule. It runs continuously, meaning it doesn't stop. And it also has the ability to attach to the uh, three prime end of the molecule because if this end is three prime, the new daughter strand will be five prime. So you see here in this picture how the parent strand is three prime and the daughter strand up top will be five prime. That's a good clue to let you know that this is the leading strand. So you can tell it's a leading strand. You'll put the primer down on the five prime end and then you will just have your DNA primase, I'm sorry, DNA polymerase just move on along and continue to synthesize one long continuous molecule. So you see as it continues to replicate, it's going to make one long molecule. So what's on the bottom here, you look at uh, this second diagram, it's on the bottom, no problem. The third diagram, it's on the bottom, no problem. So this is going to be your easiest strand. Is the leading strand always on the bottom? No, it depends on how the parent strand has its five prime and three prime ends. If the parent strand had these numbers flipped and you had three prime, five prime on the top and five prime and three prime on the bottom, then your leading strand will be on the top part of that molecule. It's going to follow these rules. It's going to be attached to the parent uh, three prime to five prime end because it will make an opposite five prime to three prime end for the daughter strand. Um, and it's going to be in one long molecule and run continuously. That is your leading strand. If you need to rewind that part, if you need to restart it, please do. Okay, the lagging strand runs discontinuously. I'm going to explain why. As it runs discontinuously, instead of having one long molecule, it's made up of many, many small molecules called Okazaki fragments. And this was the scientist who discovered it, um, Dr. Okazaki. So these Okazaki fragments consist of a DNA primer and new DNA. Once you make these Okazaki fragments, you have to glue them or connect them together using a new enzyme called DNA ligase. So lagging strand runs discontinuously which is opposite than leading. It's made up of small fragments, which we call Okazaki fragments, much different than a long molecule. And then all these tiny fragments are glued together by DNA ligase. So let's explain or look why we have to run it backwards. Remember, our direction of replication is to the right, but DNA can only move from five prime to three prime. So in this leading strand, it has no problem going from five prime, you see five, running to three prime. It's going five to three, five to three, all the way from the top or at the bottom. It's five to three. This lagging strand, because the parent strand is five here, our new daughter strand has to be three on this end, which will mean that the right side, or basically the replication area, the direction we're supposed to be going, is actually five prime. So the only way this molecule can move is from here to here. It has to still go from five to three, five to three. But obviously that's not the direction of replication. So what it does is it goes from five to three, it stops and then it jumps way behind it and then it lands here and then it goes from five to three and it jumps way behind it in five to three. So that's what I'll jump down to the very bottom one. Again, we're keeping the same numbers even though they're not on the screen. We're starting with the five. It goes a little bit to three. It jumps five to three, it stops, falls off, starts again over here, five to three, five to three. And again, once you have these little tiny fragments, you would then have the DNA ligase come together to glue them together. So again, 
please make sure that you take the notes. Please make sure you listen to the words that I'm saying along with the text that's written on the slides as well. Um, so again, this is just trying to, you know, show you another picture of how this occurs just for other examples. Again, be really familiar with how these um, five prime and three prime numbers occur. See if you can find where the leading strand and lagging strand would be. Because we're not, um, you know, in person, I can't show you a video, but there are a lot of great videos on YouTube. All I did was type in le leading and lagging strand DNA replication. And this was just a few of them that is showing you kind of what's happening. So you can see some of the terms we talked about, primase, uh, ligase. You can see here, somebody's drawing it. You'll be able to see um, the primer with the lagging strand versus the primer with the leading strand. You see parent is five, I'm sorry, parent is five and three. So that means the daughter is five, two, three which goes in the direction of our replication, um, you know, all these things. So please take time to be familiar with these concepts so that if you ever see them on an exam, you'll be prepared. Again, I'm just showing you another example. We're going to open up our DNA strand. We have these replication forks that are in place. As we identify what the numbering of our parent strand are, we can then identify, okay, if the parent strand is three prime here, that means my daughter strand is five prime here. The direction of replication is to the left. So that makes sense for this to be the leading strand, five prime to three prime. And then if you jump down, you see on the lagging strand, it has to go the opposite way, but that's why we're going to start to make multiple Okazaki fragments. So you'll start here, then you'll jump back here, and then as this opens up, you'll be able to go further back, um, and then eventually we can link them together through the DNA ligase. So DNA replication is very accurate. We only have a mistakes, maybe one every 100 million nucleotides, so that's obviously very, very good. Um, and these are three mechanisms that your body can use to make sure you maintain accuracy. So one is hydrogen bonding. So the bonds that form between the A and the T are very, very stable. The bonds that form between G and C are also stable. However, if you try to bond a C with a T or a G with an A, it is not stable at all. So that mismatch is going to help your body realize that you have had some type of issue with accuracy. The second thing is the active site for DNA polymerase is not going to form bonds if they're not paired correctly. So we talked about enzymes and how specific enzymes are, and they have very high specificity. So if that DNA polymerase is supposed to interact with a particular nucleotide based off of those instructions, it will not form um, or be very unlikely to form if that is not the correct pair. And finally, DNA polymerase has a little bit of a backspace button, so it can proofread if there are any mismatch pairs. So as DNA polymerase is going along, just like if you're typing a paper and you misspell something, it can back up, make that change, and then continue to move along. Uh, we're only talking about DNA polymerase in this course, but there are other DNA repair enzymes in your body that you can use to be able to correct the DNA if you've made a mistake at some point. Okay, so this concludes the lecture that we've had on this material. However, if there was anything that was confusing, please re-watch this lecture. This is why I'm recording it so you can watch it, pause it, rewind it, make sure that you understand and process this information. If you have any questions, please make sure to write them down and then during class time or office hours, I will be able to help you to understand it. Um, there is an additional lecture, but please review the notes on Blackboard to get directions as to where that is. Thank you.